And that woman there, both of whom are called Kate. <laughs> um, uh, we've been doing, the Fantasy Theatre has been hosting dialogues since 1994. Um, we started the company with a, a show by a great artist that another great artist introduced me to and um, kept me out of med school, um, <laughs> named David Hancock. And after we did David's play, we did a dialogue on um, genocide, because what, uh, what was going on in um, Bosnia at that time was really good. So. And so for a number of years, we hosted dialogues that asked questions about things that were actually happening that we didn't understand why they were happening, and more specifically, um, it was like a giant, I always say, they were like a giant pause button to go, wait a minute, this is happening, is this what we mean? And then um, in 2004, I went to the World Social Forum, uh, was it 2004? Yeah, or five. I went to the World Social Forum in Brazil, and I realized um, how much prefiguration there was in the world. And what I mean by that is how many people are dealing with issues in really proactive ways, where the future is being, a different future is being built by their work right now. And um, so this idea of identifying things that are happening started to shift around that time when we said, well, these things are happening and these are some of the really exciting things that are also happening in response and out of um, some of these issues. And so um, this is Foundry Dialogues 2015. So we're in our 21st year, which is kind of remarkable. Um, and again, um, we're also always looking for ways that artists themselves are asking new questions and learning from people that we haven't met yet. And so some of those people are on the panel tonight and um, who are in many ways living the future now, which is how I understand prefiguration. So um, thank you again for um, coming and it was a pleasure to invite people to this and um, have a nice time. <laughs> I need to introduce um, Nana Sen, who was the curator, who is the curator of this series, and it's because of her that all these remarkable people are coming together. Hi everyone, how are you all doing? Good. Um, I'm just going to take a few minutes to tell you about all of our wonderful speakers today, so you can have a little bit more context about the work that they do. Um, and uh, they're, I think they're hanging around in the back, so folks, you can make your way to the front of the room when you have a second. Um, so we have on the panel today Becca Economopoulos, uh, who is the co-founder of uh, Not an Alternative, an arts collective with the mission to affect popular understandings of events, symbols, institutions, and history. Through engaged critical research and design, Not an Alternative curates and produces interventions on immaterial and material space, bringing together tools from art, architecture, exhibition design, and political organizing. Um, Not an Alternative's most recent ongoing project is this amazing thing called the Natural History Museum, a new museum that offers exhibitions, expeditions, workshops, public programming, and unlike traditional uh, natural history museums, it actually turns an anthropological lens onto the institution of museums and makes the point to highlight social political forces that shape nature. So when you get a chance, maybe after um, the dialogue, all of these exhibits in, uh, in the space have been produced, designed, produced, and created by uh, the Natural History Museum, and they reflect a lot of the content that we have been inspired by from Naomi Klein's uh, book, This Changes Everything, so I'd encourage you to take a look. Um, Rachel Falcone is the co-director of uh, Storyline Media. Rachel uses oral history, art, and technology to engage people in the telling of their own stories. She's the co-founder and executive producer of the award-winning transmedia storytelling project Sandy Storyline. As part of her multimedia project, Housing is a Human Right, Rachel has produced first-person stories about the housing series and the human right to housing movement. Um, she has also been an organizer for social movement organizations, including Occupy Our Homes and, and organizing for occupation. Thank you. 
Elizabeth is born and uh, has been born and raised in New York City. She is a nationally recognized Puerto, Re Puerto Rican attorney and environmental justice leader. She is now the ED of Uprose, which is Brooklyn's oldest Latino community-based organization. Her award-winning vision for an intergenerational, multicultural, and community-led organization is the driving force behind Uprose. She is a longtime advocate and trailblazer for community organizing around sustainable development, environmental justice, community-led climate adaptation, and community resiliency in Sunset Park. And Mallory is our moderator today. Mallory is an Obie Award-winning um, director and dramaturg of performance across disciplines. She's the artistic director of Restless NYC, an on and off-site theatrical enterprise that ex ex excavates the classical repertoire as a source of contemporary performance to engage the past in a dialogue about life in the present. As a dramaturg, she has worked on projects for Lincoln Center, Director's Lab, Mayi, The Culture Project, The Labyrinth, XP Girl, Free Fall Dance Company, and Urban Stages. Um, so please join me in giving a round of
you have a, like a specific project other than that you feel like is a good manifestation of that in your mind? Yeah, um, yeah, a few weeks ago we teamed up, so the Natural History Museum is a museum that's registered with the American Alliance of Museums. Um, we do everything traditional natural history museums do, but we make a point to highlight the socio-political and economic um, forces shaping nature. Um, and we teamed up with dozens of the world's top scientists several weeks ago, including several Nobel laureates, to release a letter calling on science museums to cut all ties to the fossil fuel industry. Mm -hmm. um, and then in tandem with that, uh, launched a petition calling on our country's two biggest natural history museums, the Smithsonian in DC and the American Museum of Natural History here in New York, to kick David Koch off their boards. Um. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it sounds like you guys know who David Koch is, um, so I won't go into that, but, uh, but yeah, within a week, two weeks, 250,000 petition signatures. Um, and that scientist letter also like, struck a nerve. Um, it, it made headlines around the world. There were hundreds of news articles. Um, and, and it almost sort of blindsided us. Uh, I think it's just sort of a no-brainer to get climate deniers Climate science deniers out of science museums <laughs> and these spaces that communicate science to the public. Um, so yeah, maybe that's a bit of this like contradiction thing um, that we are really interested in is sort of borrowing the aesthetic vocabulary, the presentation forms um, of a natural history museum that mediates understandings of nature um, in order to uh, offer a different perspective on nature as a commons and tell stories about climate change that include the role of the fossil fuel lobby and that offer the justice perspective and that amplify the voices of communities on the front lines of the climate crisis. I'm so glad you talked about that. That's such good work. Um, so I guess I'm a little late to the environmental game. Um, I grew up in New Jersey and I spent most of my summers on the Jersey Shore. Um, how many of you all have been to the Jersey Shore? <laughs> Love the Jersey Shore. Um, so my parents actually moved there and have been there, and they live a block from the ocean. And so, so my, you know, a lot of my notion of place is like standing with my feet in the water, looking at the ocean. Um, and so for the last like eight years, I've been doing a lot of work around housing and home and the idea of displacement, mostly in New York, but also nationally. I have a storytelling project called Housing as a Human Right, and. And so when you know Hurricane Sandy hit um, New York, New Jersey, I think like many New Yorkers, I you know I started to make the connection between things in my own life and sort of bigger issues of the environment and climate change. And um, and so I like very quickly actually my collaborator and I went to Red Hook, um, where there was an amazing hub that was developing because of a really strong existing community group there called Red Hook Initiative. And so, you know, I, I lived in Brooklyn, my parents were okay, although they're by the shore, they lost power, but they weren't flooded. So, you know, I wasn't hit because I live in um, Bed-Stuy, which is one of the higher parts of Brooklyn. So right after the storm, the, like the next day, I went out to Red Hook to see if I could help. And I brought my recorder because that's kind of like what I do, and I think of just wanting to listen to people and see what was happening. And so what was so fascinating was, you know, people were sitting in the charging station and had all their cell phones out, like many places around New York, and, and were starting to tell stories showing images of what they had taken. And so there was like, one woman with a picture of a, like, this insane um, tree that had fallen into a public housing unit, actually, in, in uh, I think it was in Bed-Stuy. And so she, and she, they were sort of starting to talk over the images. And I kind of had this overwhelming feeling that there was no way that I could tell that story by myself. There was just like hundreds of people in this charging station and they all had incredible stories that they wanted to share both about the storm itself and what was happening and what they were making of it. And, and we had done a lot of work with folks in New Orleans, post Katrina, particularly on the housing and displacement and, and the total decimation of public housing down there after Katrina. And so pretty quickly we realized that this was going to be years um, to rebuild, and, and sort of how much, how much um, now our homes were being threatened by something else. And so for me, that was Sandy was kind of like a moment. I think for like many people, to kind of start to see that there was something 
larger that was going to make all the other problems we were dealing with, whether or not it was homelessness, you know, lack of jobs, all of these things, the foreclosure crisis, it was going to make it that much worse. And so for me, that was kind of the moment of starting to connect these issues um, and to get involved. So. My story is a little different from what I found in Gente. Um, my, uh, I'm a descendant of colonization and slavery, so uh, when I think about extraction, I begin with the extraction of the labor of my people, and then we start talking about extraction of fossil fuel. And so when you think about that history, um, one of the things I think about is how generationally, one generation after the other has been exposed to the worst housing, the worst food, the worst living condition, living with stress generation after generation after generation and have that, how that shows up as disease. And so um, I remember as a child, one of my first experiences where I thought, uh, I can't do this. I'm going to have to fight for things. Um, first, let me just say my mom said that I came out of the womb with the fist first. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember as a little girl, I had um, an uncle. He was black, transgender, and fabulous. He taught me how to put on makeup and taught me how to do the catwalk. And I remember all the suffering and all the abuse he went through because he was black, because he was transgender, and because he didn't speak English. And I remember putting my body in front of him to protect him from having people throw rocks at him when I was about five years old. Mm -hmm. And I think that my early uh, experiences watching my Uncle Robert go through that and listening to my mom's stories about how um, they were beaten up with these things called garrison belts when they first moved to the United States from Puerto Rico. I remember thinking, I will never let those things happen. Um, but in terms of environmental justice and the work that I do, but I, those are my early experiences. Those are the things that I remember and a lot more stories that would take a lot more time. Um, but those were the early ones. I think my uncle had a major effect on me because he was so kind, so generous, so gentle and people were so cruel, and I always think that if he lived today, he would live such a different kind of life. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I always, you know, I, I always learn that there's nothing more fundamental than the right to breathe, that if you can't uh, breathe, you can't fight against bad, uh, bad policing, you can't fight for housing, you can't fight for any of those things. My father died uh, in the South Bronx of an asthma attack at the age of 50. Uh, a few years ago, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I've never done drugs. A few years ago, I had a severe bilateral pulmonary embolism. I have all of the conditions that one has, having been born and raised in an environmental justice community, uh, living next to environmental burdens. Um, and so there is a direct um, correlation between the work that I'm doing how I grew up and the places that I lived and was displaced from growing up, and the history of my people. Uh, the fact that no matter where we live, anywhere in the United States as people of color, we're the most likely to be living next to uh, environmental burdens. And so, um, so I went into the environmental justice movement because I thought that it was probably the most important thing to be doing. And um, in the time that I've done it, we have Stop the siting of power plants. We've doubled the amount of open space. All of our young people get into first-year colleges. We've sent three to Antarctica, one to the North Pole. Uh, we uh, were the front line of the People's Climate March. We insisted that it be uh, made up of young people of color. I remember saying last year that um, if um, that that when you see young people on TV, it's when they're doing the perp walk, and young people needed to be seeing young people of color needed to be seen in leadership. And so um, so the work has really grown organically. I didn't um, take an environmental policy class in my life. Uh, it was basically what needed to be done, and we've learned about energy, we've learned about ground fields, about open space, you name it. We learn it because we are resourceful. Um, and so one of the things that we've done recently uh, in response to the community's request after Sandy is we built uh, the Climate Justice Center, which is a block to block organizing effort around adaptation and resiliency, which we're gonna talk about later. Uh, but I think my entire trajectory has really grown from having been born and raised into struggle. So uh, that's, that's it in a nutshell. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, good, okay, so what I, um, next question is just, I think a lot of, one of the objectives of this is to get certain kinds of language out in the mix and talk about 
how it operates um, within the construct of talking about climate change and environmental um, this, this realm. So I'm just curious for each of you, how do you understand how do you understand climate change? I think you kind of already got the ball rolling a little bit on, on this topic. But, and how do things like race, class, gender, immigration, and um, privilege relate to climate change? Are we going in a line? Um, I, you can just jump right in. I mean, you've gotten us on the, I mean, we're already kind of on, on the topic. Yeah, um, yeah, so, you know, Climate change is a, at the intersection of everything that we need, food, housing, employment, social services, everything. And for frontline communities that have really, are the ones that are going to be most impacted by climate change and the ones least responsible for creating it. Um, and the fact that by 2042 we're gonna be a majority of this country, this is an issue that we have to own and that we have to drive. And so privilege comes into the fact that um, it is the one, it is the largest obstacle to climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, privilege is the largest obstacle to climate change. We have a lot of well-intentioned people uh, who don't know how to come in and work to build just relationships, who have always been in power, who want to control, who want to turn us into passive recipients of their bet of their or of their good intentions, uh, people who are what I consider a contemporary missionaries. Uh, folks that don't understand that if we're going to survive climate change, we're going to have to build a different kind of power dynamic, a different kind of economy, that we're going to have to engage in just transitions and work with each other differently. And that, you know, we can think about technology and we can think about how you reduce carbon and how you can get engaged in attenuation of sea level rise. We can do the complicated stuff, but what we can't do is address this issue of privilege. And so, um, so these spaces are really important spaces for people to come correct and to understand how they show up into our spaces and how you build those relationships that we've never really had before. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, um, I think it's extremely important in this conversation. And then resilience, and I'll stop there. Um, I'm gonna get to that. Okay, Can okay, I get cool. to that? Because I think this is actually yeah. really great, this idea of privilege <laughs> in terms of like, getting this up. From you, mm -hmm. but I think it's really good because I think from, from both of your perspectives, like how do you encounter this idea of privilege and what are the things that you do within your practice that deal with this issue? Because I, I think it is, I think this is a, a huge issue and, and, I, and I think it's a really important, it's, it's key to like actually getting anything to change, which is why we're all here, you know? So I'm just wondering in terms of, of the framing of this question more specifically in terms of privilege. Well, one thing I wanna say that I um, really appreciate that Elizabeth has made very clear is that climate change is not an environmental issue, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it, it, it's an issue to, it's capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. It is, we are severing the life support systems of, of the planet, and um, it does not just have to do with the environment, it has to do with ourselves and our communities, and um, and it is an issue of equity and justice, right? Um, and so there is a great asymmetry in the burden of responsibility, right? It's not enough to say that climate change is anthropogenic or human-caused. There are some humans that, uh, are more responsible than others or some collections and institutions and people. Um, and there are some who will bear the brunt of the impacts and, um, and the, that, that burden much more so than others. And that, those are the fault lines um, that have been you know, born because of this, um, this economic system that suggests that unlimited growth in a finite system is possible. It's not. Um, and so, uh, so I think it's very important that when we talk about climate change, we are also talking about um, racial profiling and community policing and food security and immigration and all of these other issues, um, militarization. Uh, the immigration fight that we're having now is setting the stage for how we're gonna deal with uh, climate refugees in the future, and in fact, already are. Um, millions upon millions of people migrating. Um, and so, uh, so that speaks directly to the issue of privilege, right? Um, today, the discourse on climate change has been framed by um, the United Nations, by you know, nation states, by um, big green NGOs. Um, by corporations, and um, and it's 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 framed as an issue of greenhouse gas emissions, 
and so the solution is clean technology. Right? But if you, but there's omitted variables in that equation, right? If if you if you understand the solution to climate change, if you're defining the problem just as greenhouse gas emissions, um, then then sure, 100% uh, clean energy, great. But what that doesn't account for is the reality that climate change is already happening, right? We're already in the middle of it. And we can expect more extreme weather events. And so the question is, how are we responding to climate change? And are we incentivizing or encouraging individualistic responses or collective ones? Are we stepping on each other's heads on our way to the life raft? Are we pulling our brothers and sisters up? And, um, and I think that's especially important because you've got projects like Eco Atlantic in Nigeria, right, that are like 100 percent, you know, zero carbon clean energy that are lauded by many of the powers with by that be and, and many of the big greens, right, um, that, that cost six million dollars for a single plot where the average Lagosian makes two dollars a day. Um, and so we have to be thinking about this um, at the community level, but also not just our communities right here, but like communities around the world. And to me, that's, that's a vocabulary of solidarity that is very intertwined um, with an understanding of privilege. And, it's, and it requires that those of us with greater privilege understand that, tell that story, knock on the halls of power, dismantle these dominant uh, narratives and um, create space for those who are telling alternate stories, um, that, that, that could be our salvation. Yeah, I mean, when we think about who's deep, you know, both of you touched on the fact that when we think about who is so deeply impacted by, um, by climate change, it's the most vulnerable communities who are dealing with everything else. Um, they're dealing, so for example, just, you know, through the lens of Sandy, the communities that were the most deeply impacted by the storm um, were the ones that didn't have money to buy the food that was spoiled, um, didn't have the the ability to figure out how to get to work when there was no, the transit was completely shut down. Um, don't have the money to rebuild. One of the communities that we've been looking at um, is a community called Baymar that's in Rockland County. And when we think of Sandy, we don't often think of people upstate. And so we've been um, collaborating with that community to tell their story because it's a mobile home community. And it's people that have had the most vulnerable housing situation before the storm. And so they were already being exploited in the way that um, they were living. It's they, basically the mobile home community is um, you own the home and structure that you live in, but you have to rent the land. And, and so, you know, they already were dealing with sort of, you know, having to up the rental payments and being low income. And then after Sandy, immediately, you know, unlike a homeowner that doesn't have that immediate burden, they had, um, like two days after the storm, people came and knocked on their door and said, where's rent? So gave them no leeway, absolutely no leeway. And so they were stuck in a situation a lot. Half the community is um, mostly immigrant community and half um, low-income white folks. And so they were in a situation where they weren't able to even think about applying for aid. They were in a situation where it's, you know, if you can't pay me rent, you're gonna lose your home and lose everything. You've already lost all your possessions. You've lost your ability to go to work. You're gonna probably have to rent somewhere else to live. And, and, you're, and it's your squeeze that much more. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing that, I mean, both here in New York and New Jersey, but then globally on different scales, where communities are being squeezed when often they, they aren't sort of the biggest perpetrators um, of the fossil fuel industry, and so they're, but they're the most vulnerable. And so, you know, I think, I'm so happy that you brought up the idea of privilege. I think some of our work has been to try to think about how do we amplify specifically the voices of frontline communities who are not heard and are drowned out after disasters. And so, um, particularly after Katrina, we saw that, you know, this disaster, disaster complex sort of comes in and sweeps in and policymakers sort of determine what is going to be happen in terms of development, in terms of rebuilding, in terms of where all the money is going to go. And so, one of the things that we did is start a project called Sandy Storyline with the idea that no one person should be dictating what the story is and the narrative um, after a disaster. And it should really be an opportunity for the communities that are most impacted to share their stories. 
And so we invite anybody that is impacted to share um, through an online platform, through a phone line, and have been sort of experimenting with how do you just create the space and that opening for people to actually share and have their voice heard as part of the as part of um, this disaster response. Um, yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go into the next question, which is this question of resiliency. Um, and it was interesting in the last panel, the panel prior to this, which was about the body, this is about community, and we're going to do the idea of the state and then the planet. It was interesting because the, the two speakers found this word resiliency as being like a really good metaphor in terms of dealing with, with how they think about um, what they're doing. And, and when, when we were talking about it, interestingly it came up is that, and Melissa was going to talk about her her difficulty with this word, and I'm wondering just like this idea of how, why this word may not scale in a, in a certain sense. So from, and also like just um, moving a little bit, trying to kind of see our way forward beyond kind of these traumatic situations that get, that, that our people are dealing with right now. So being resilient right now, sorry to get my back to coolness. <laughs> I don't know whether it's, it's really hot in here or I'm having a middle-aged moment. <laughs> So the word resiliency means to bounce back. And why would low-income people and people of color want to bounce back to unemployment, to racism, to uh, a lack of the kinds of, um, if you look at Katrina, um, you know, why would anyone want to bounce back to where they were before? Mm -hmm. so, um, so even for the Gulf South Rising, for those of us who are part of the Climate Justice Alliance, uh, all of us have revisited this word and decided that the word is resistance. That we can't use the word resiliency because the word resiliency, you know, nobody wants to go back to the situation that they were in before. And, and in addition, that we're finding that all of our successes around the environment are contributing to our displacement. So, um, so this this word resiliency um, is also a word that is used so lightly, almost like. Um, it's okay, they're going to go back to being where they were before. Well, you know, people of color, you know, one of the things that I always say is that there isn't anything, anybody more sustainable than a poor person. That we've always been able to recycle, repurpose, reuse, because we had to, because, because our lack of resources made us that. Um, and so our, you know, we're the ones who survived and we're here, so does that mean we're resilient? Um, that word, that word pr presents uh, a lot of problems for us. And so we're using the word resistance because we want to say that we want to resist uh, this, this, uh, this idea that we have to go back to where we were before. So something happened, it was serious, there was an extreme weather event. Um, now how do we rebuild and how do we make sure that we engage in just transitions, that econ the economy changes and that we're moving forward in a way that's more just. So I, I think that that's, that's where it came from. And I have a, um, a question. Uh, Rebecca, in the sense of like when we started talking, you were talking about feeling uncomfortable in terms of talking about just like you're representing yourself, and that a lot of what not an alternative does is re represent a collective and this idea of the collective. And I'm wondering if you can talk about this idea of maybe resistance or resilience in terms of this discussion about the self versus the collective. In well, it's funny that you say that. I had I hadn't really um, unpacked. Uh, the term resiliency until we started talking about it, and I really appreciate what you just said. That makes a lot of sense to me. It's it's uh, it's a framework we've inherited, right? Adapt mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency are the buzzwords that frame like mitigation is the reduction of carbon emissions, and adaptation is adapting to a changing climate, and resiliency is about um, you know strength strengthening uh, and bouncing back, right? But I feel like resiliency um, just triggers for me like this thought of like pull yourself up by bootstraps. You know, this sort of um, uh, kind of guiding story for like American individualism. So it, it actually it doesn't like it doesn't feel like it invokes community as much it invokes the individual to me, which I think is mm -hmm. the problem. <laughs> like so much of the problem. Um, is like, ha it, and in fact, it's like they're very competing understandings of nature, right? And um, and that's where, as a museum, it, we are interested in presenting an understanding of 
nature is something that we um, are, you know, uh, have have inherited from our ancestors, and we are here for a time, and we shepherd and steward for generations, for the common good for generations to come. Not something to be like chopped up and sold off to the highest bidder. Um, and so it's the it's the tug of war between the public and the private, the privatizing forces, and under neoliberal capitalism, and um, and the public. And I feel like. Um, yeah, if you're to understand resiliency as connected to this um, sort of dominant uh, narrative of um, American individualism, that it, that just sort of reinforces um, all these other structuring um, stories that um, that yeah that that reinforce the status quo. Yeah, I'm just curious, like the the sort of like the. the the individual versus the collective and dealing with these larger issues, like how how each of you may sort of negotiate that idea. I mean, I think in, in the work that you do, it's with Storyline Sandy, you know, it's about individuals voicing their story. And like, how, did, how does this play between the individual and this American story and this, this collective idea? How does it like play itself out or how do you negotiate that? Elizabeth or um, Rachel, like in terms of, is it something that you're encountering all the time or is it, do you think about it at all? Or like, is it, is it an issue in terms of the work that you do or not? You know, sometimes, and I would say it's a US story. I would call it an American story because there are 21 Spanish speaking countries in America and Canada. So I, I, I just have a problem with referring to this country as America. I call it the United States of so um, I, I think that um, some of the tensions that we see in trying, what we do is we facilitate community engagement. And mitigation is important to us because mitigation is about reducing NOx, SOx, PN 2.5, all of the things that have gotten our community sick because we're the reluctant host of the environmental burdens that serve everybody else, right? So mitigation is important. Adaptation is important, but there's also a historical context that there are things that our people used to know how to do, right? And to become an American means to be American US, to be addicted to consumption culture, to throw things away. And that's why you see people, you know, living outside of public housing in a big SUV, because the thing is you want to acquire more and more and more because things mean that you were successful. But who people used to be uh, were people who were connected to the land, who knew how to make things, who knew how to live differently. And so the idea of adaptation for us is reclaiming who we were before we became what we are. That's, that's part of it. Uh, and then the individualism, one of the problems is that when people come to this country, they want everything that they have been watching on television, everything they've been reading. The American dream is to have you know, the two cars and the house and all of these things. And then in facilitating their engagement and to try to create a community that is prepared for the next extreme weather event, we have to tell them what you are going to have to value and what you're going to reclaim is your indigenous ancestry, who you were, because those are the things that are going to help us survive. And so there is this uh, opportunity to create the space to talk about those things, about who people were, because it's almost like you're saying to people, well, now that you're here, now that you finally crossed that border with a, you know, with a gallon of water, you can't have those things because climate change is here, and you had nothing to do with it. Um, so, so, so the idea is to use their history, their culture, their, anything they bring from wherever they're coming from to sort of redefine what being an American is. Um, and so, um, and that's a real cool thing, facilitating that kind of engagement and people saying, yeah, that's true, we have to live differently now. And, and living differently may seem like an individual thing, but, it's, uh, but it gives people the power to make choices about what to purchase, where to put their dollars, what corporations to support and which ones not to support. It's much larger than that. So that's the context that the individual versus the collective comes in. And that's, uh, and that's an ongoing community building process. Um, and, and, it's, and it's just, you know, and, and you have to also know how to facilitate it so that you don't, you don't, you don't manage or control the conversation. You have to sort of check your privilege and step back. 
And, um, and then you find that you learn a lot and that those things that people, the least expected people, people with the, the, the lowest educational attainment levels have answers that redefine how we do our work. I, I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, no, I okay. think you did. I mean, I also like wrapping back around to this yeah. idea of privilege and the, the distinction and, and the way you facilitate those ideas coming from the communities as opposed to like things being uh, proposed. <laughs> to a very specific agenda that's that's proposed. Um, I'm gonna, I, oh, so here's, this is the question about, and I think we're sort of getting there, the difference between, more sort of language question, the difference between preparing communities for stability versus adaptability. I mean, this is interesting, this is the first time I've heard this idea that adaptability actually has to do with kind of almost like reclaiming or going um, backwards, in a sense, in the, in the sense of reclaiming something historically that your culture had that has been <coughs> lost, perhaps. Um, so it's, it's actually, it's interesting because I think when we think about adaptability, we think about moving forward in some sense. So, but, but ultimately the word is really just change in any sense, right? So that's, that's interesting to me. And, and, and also, like, do you use this word stability in the work that you do? And I'm just curious about that. You were talking about not using stability very much, or feeling. No, I mean, I think it's about people want to, people feel like lost, right, when they've gone through trauma. So people want to, in some ways, reclaim something that they've lost, but they also want to move forward, and they want to improve their community, and they want to have the opportunity to do that, and, and sort of the power to do that. And so I don't tend to use the word, it, it comes more in terms of, like, loss, and sort of what you want to what you want to gain, get back, I guess. So after the feeling of loss, you're kind of seeking a sort of stable environment. Yeah. In which and just to add to the conversation around individual and community, I mean, I think that's what, what the power of organizing is, right? So how do we, like, connect our stories and individual experiences? I think it is a really American thing that we are, like, the me, 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 like, having done storytelling internationally. It's people are much more community-oriented and almost it's hard to get people internationally to say um, I or to talk about the personal experience. Mm -hmm. And I find much more in, in America it's the I, but I think that's the power of community organizing is that we, like it's bringing and facilitating people coming together and seeing themselves as connected and then you know, taking power and, and making change together in a unified way. And so I think this is a real opportunity for people to see themselves as connected in ways that they haven't. Yeah, and I, you bring up the word power. Like, I mean, to me, that's that's where the collective comes into play. And you know, you're you're doing community organizing in Sunset Park. So, uh, of course, you speak at the individual body level, right? But it's um, it's it's in long-term sustained community organizing that you build power. And to me, that question of stability, I don't stability versus adaptation as much as it is stability versus precarity. Um, and you know, and it is through mutual aid and and um, you know and, and solidarity and collectivism, community building power, that we become stable as as communities. And I think about how um, you know, going back to this idea of like uh, defining climate change as greenhouse gases, and so clean energy is the solution. I mean, Bloomberg is like our, the, was the green mayor. He's flown around the world to talk about Plan NYC. Yet he was also the gentrification mayor. You know, like, and um, and so um, so I think that that um, this individual versus collective to me is like individualism is is really like the logic of neoliberalism. It's atomizing. It's deregulation. It's privatization. And we see it reinforced in so many spaces. Like you go to the Natural History Museum where it talks about climate change, and at the end of it, you know, they, they talk about recycling and individual consumer choices, right? So where are the exhibitions that talk about collective choices and collective power building and community organizing and the work that um, is represented? Do you know, I'm wondering just in terms of like, because we're, we're I'm, I've been, you know, pushing the conversation in this very binary way between the individual and the collective. And like, um, it's a, I'm just wondering, do you feel like we're in this moment where, where there's a, we need to, 
like the opportunity is to find a different way for uh, an individual to kind of like acclimate themselves within this relationship with with the the planet, with each other, with themselves. Is there are we can we see a way forward where we don't have this choice of either to be the individual, either the collective, or like is there an opportunity within the work that you're doing to kind of um, reimagine that binary in some in some way? I don't know if I'm being totally clear, but I feel like that that the collective versus the individual is something that we're kind of stuck with. Yeah. And and I wonder if in this moment that we're in, whether there's a like whether we should be trying to identify ourselves in some, not either or, but like um, a more connected way, or is there a different way maybe to look at that binary, do you think? Or is there something that um, has proposed itself in the work? I'm so lost, <laughs> um, but um, I'm sorry. I'm um, sorry. Um, what we try to do mm -hmm. um, is we try to provide as much information as we can so people can make informed choices and let them know um, what the connection is between extreme weather events all over the world and the way that they're living, and fossil fuel extraction and the way that they're living and the way that they live. We try to connect all the dots um, so that people can make those, those decisions. And we really believe that the path to climate justice is local and that um, that's really where change is going to happen. You know, I mentioned before that by 2042, people of color will be the majority of the, of the country. And while that scares some people, the reason it's important, the reason it's extremely important, is that um, those of us who are children in the civil rights movement felt really strongly about the civil rights movement. That was something that we knew that if we were able to get an education, if we were able to do anything, it was because the civil rights movement had happened. And, and some of us, made a commitment that we were going to continue to work for that. Um, if people in our communities all over the country, uh, or the majority, and become the majority, um, are not driving the climate change agenda, if they don't own it the way that the generation before us on the civil rights movement, this country is in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. And so the reason that I raised that, um, mm -hmm. it, and raised the issue of privilege, and raised the issue of how it has to happen in Detroit, in Philly, in LA, in Chicago, in Brooklyn, in the South Bronx, in Miami, it has to happen in all the places where a lot of people live, is because all of those are communities that are particularly vulnerable to climate change. Uh, they, just to give you a few examples, our elected officials, this is how, this is how conventional they are. And they, they don't mean any, any harm by this. If they have to be on a committee, they're going to be on the criminal justice committee, on the housing committee, on the employment committee. It never occurs to them to serve on the agriculture committee or the energy committee. Um, there isn't any thinking about this in an institutional way about how we address this, you know, from that that point of view. Funding for uh, the environment comes through one place, through DEC, instead of coming through every single. Um, I'm not thinking Spanish, and I'm not thinking every single agency, which it should. So all of these things really sort of require that there be a groundswell of support on the ground, right? I'm, I'm being redundant with that. That that has to happen on the ground. That we have to be building these connections that people have to see of their survivability and the future of their children connected to climate change. And there has to be discussion about the intersection of all of these things. Um, and then everything else will follow. Because once you have that, once you have that groundswell, that the officials are going to listen. Once they listen, you know, it, it's, all, it's all really connected. So I don't know how to answer the questions in the way that you frame them. Uh, I just think that there's this climate justice frame that makes sense to us. And, um, and that uh, in organizing and talking to people, it's something that, they, that resonates with them. They understand it. Um, and that there are things, and you know, I, I mentioned the traditions, because you, know, you think about a community like Sunset Park. Well, Sunset Park is, is sort of a, a microcosm of what's going to happen in this country. You've got people from the Middle East. You've got people from China. You've got people from Central America, South America, the Caribbean. These are people who know struggle. They know they have survived all kinds of things. Those are things we can learn from. Uh, someone asked me on, on Spanish radio, since you're from the United States, what can you teach our friends 
you know, in Latin America. So what can they teach us? Mm -hmm. There's a lack of humility that we have about what we can learn mm -hmm. from people in Brazil and all of these places that had to survive a lot of things. Um, you talk to the people from the Pan-African Climate Justice Alliance, and they can tell you about what's happening there and, and how they need support. So we are connected internationally to folks all over the world. It's the same struggle. It's, what do they say? It's one struggle, many fronts, right? So it's, it's the same struggle everywhere. Um, but um, I think that it really starts community by community and, um, and, and making sure that people are giving the tools and the support and the information that they need so that they can inform choices and they can start building that grand swell of support for, for climate, for addressing climate change. Yeah, and just to add, I mean, I think the connection, the biggest thing that came to mind was just like the notion of the foreclosure crisis for me was, you know, one moment where people didn't share that they were in crisis. So, you know, one of the things we found doing a lot of storytelling is like no one wanted to talk about it because it's, it's just really shameful. You feed, a lot of people internalize the notion, particularly when you've like earned and become a homeowner, and you've done that to struggle to become a homeowner, and then feeling like you've personally failed. Um, and then that's why you're in that situation. And I think for a lot of the work of the, of the housing movement is trying to tell people that it's not them and that they're connected to larger things. And I think the same thing with the, the climate movement. It's like, Sandy, you know, didn't just happen to you. It, it actually, you're connected to a lot of other people that are also impacted by climate change. Um, one of the interesting things, I think, at least in communities where, like, entire blocks were decimated is, like, people didn't feel necessarily alone because they could see all their neighbors impacted and they were out, all out in the street. I think it's a little harder, the organizing that happens, like, in public housing or in urban areas because still it, it feels people are out and they were out in the immediate aftermath. But after that, it's like, you know, you can go to the Lower East Side and have no idea what's happening and how people are still impacted by something that, that happened a while back. And so... So it's more hidden, and I think it's, I think that's the interesting thing about looking at um, the climate change in the New York City area is that I feel like a lot of it is behind closed doors. It sort of has to be brought out into the open through organizing efforts. Yeah. I mean, and not just through organizing efforts, I think also through the naming. I mean, we're, I, I work in like arts and cult, the arts and cultural sphere, and to think a lot about representation and storytelling and so on. And, um, I, it, just a couple of things that you guys made me think about is one in the student debt movement, the slogan, you are not alone, uh, spelled uh, like <laughs> alone, L-O-A-N. <laughs> right? and, and part of that is like um, that, that transference of like the, the space of individual shame, like I screwed up, it's my, I'm the problem, right? Um, to the point where you realize actually that this is a collective problem and that there's you know the, the power in like joining forces and teaming up and you were saying um one struggle many fronts um which i've always loved but i also love its inversion which is many struggles one front um because i think that that really works well with the climate change discourse you know we're working on housing we're working on um uh, food security we're working on um you know, displacement, we're working on so many issues, but how do we present a united front? Because we need power, right? It can't just be happening at the local level, right? You, you are mobilizing a local community, but you have a relationships around the world with communities that are doing the same thing. And then so how are we representing that as a counter power? And so I feel like that's one space where um, arts and culture sim symbols um, have currency. Um, and, and, you know, the Occupy movement was fraught. Uh, you know, there's lots, we can unpack that, and that's a whole other dialogue <laughs> series, right? But the one thing that I think that was very interesting about Occupy was that Occupy functioned as a name in common, and it wasn't about consensus. You didn't have to petition somebody uh, to say, can I sit down in a square in my town? Can I start to use twinkle fingers? You know, like, rather, um, there were there were certain you know it, it was it was actually based on disagreement yet a fidelity to a name or a symbol mm. or an aesthetic vocabulary in common that signaled the presence of a movement mm -hmm. and so okay problems aside because mm -hmm. like I said there were a whole bunch <laughs> right this is a conundrum something that we have to really be thinking about as we're talking about building power around the issue of climate change.
I mean, it's like, can I respond? Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to respond because I, I feel that one of the concerns is this language about homogeneity. And, and, and you know, it, what we celebrate difference and we think that it's important that people come to things from different perspectives and a different lens. And sometimes, um, and, you know, I don't even want to talk about Occupy and what happens in communities of color because honestly, it was like they discovered us and, mm -hmm. and, and they discovered organizing and they stayed. Um, and uh, there was a level of disrespect that is still felt. Um, and in some places, you know, like with what they did in Zandi, that was wonderful and it was great that they did that. Uh, but again, privilege um, showed up. And they weren't, and they weren't able to check it. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that was a great opportunity to build just relationships, which is why we always talk about the Hemes principles for democratic organizing. And so, it, one of the things that happens when people talk about, um, you know, working together is that there is a need to level the playing field in a lot of places, and that it, it has to be done. And we just can't assume that everything's the same everywhere, and that we can come together and have one united front. That that's good. It, it creates problems in terms of leadership, you know, that people should be able to speak for themselves, right? And when you do it in a way that says, okay, let's, I mean, we can agree in principle, let's, let's all fight against climate change. Um, but we can have stories, we can talk about the frackers and how the frackers try to bomb the front line and how they almost turned us off to fracking. I mean, when we should have been aligned, right? So I think, I think that um, we can't be um, Pollyannish and idealistic. We have to be real about the things that divide us and figure out how to build alignment in addressing all of these things direct together, uh, coming from all of the different perspectives that we have. Um, and in building that alignment, I think we have to also figure out how to build just relationships. Uh, because once people do that, they find that it's not that scary, that it's actually pretty cool, and, uh, and that we have more power. And I may not even be disagreeing with you. I just think that uh, the problem with me sometimes is the language uh, and how we disappear in language. And we cannot disappear. Mm -hmm. um, we have to speak for ourselves. We cannot have people speaking for us regardless of what their intentions are. Um, and when we come together in that space of respect, we can do amazing things like we did the march, right? There was a lot of disagreement with that march. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was... That was <coughs> Yeah. So, <laughs> so, but we did it. But we did it because we were aligned, and we made space for all the disagreements, and we made space for the diversity of perspectives, and we celebrated difference. I mean, that's I guess I don't know. Maybe I mean I don't think you said anything that I disagree <laughs> with. Yeah. I think I'm talking about represent. I'm talking about um, most people experience their news now visually, in news feeds, on television, in newspapers, et cetera, Facebook. right? That's how they're encountering things, right? On Facebook, yeah. Um, and so I'm talking about the opposite of branding, okay? Because I, and I'm speaking as an artist now, thinking about how do we communicate and signal the presence of the movement, of a movement, or um, how do we signal solidarity, et cetera. Like these are um, aesthetic problems for artists to address. Um, and in this case, um, you know, I think a traditional model is there's a coalition and we come up with branding for the coalition and what that, you know, or an organization and it's got its, you know, visual code, et cetera. What that does is smooth over difference, right? And that's, mm -hmm. that's not what I'm interested in. What I'm interested in is the opposite of branding, but rather the sort of um, collaboratively produced open sourcing of a visual language. And I use the word language because I feel like language is actually a great metaphor. It's like a lot of people from different places and communities and backgrounds contribute towards the building of a language. And as it uh, sticks, as it starts to sink into the consciousness, it becomes a word, right? And that that is, uh, that is a process that hope happens over time. And it's not a process that happens in a meeting, right? It's a, it's a process that happens all over in many different spaces and places. Um, and so again, it's, like, it's not about consensus, but it's rather an acknowledgement of disagreement and difference, yet also acknowledging resistance 
is essential and we have to have a, a means of demonstrating and making visible that that re resistance where it pops up is in relationship to one another yes. mm -hmm. so that we can signal power. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, yeah, it feels like we're, <laughs> we're talking about, you know, like there's, there's a, a thing about like, it feels like all three of you, what you're doing in a way is, is like making connections between things and, and or like that the, the organizations are there to support the that happening is like how one is connected to their past or to the to other people that are having the same problem or to you know these these bigger issues and then but the, the question I think which is handed to us by climate change is just like how do we create the critical mass to and what will that look like? What will the front look like against you know what I mean? Like, like, what do we, what, do, how can we think about that? How do we talk about that? What does the front look like? Is it simply just people on the local level pr protecting what they, you know, protecting and doing the work that they have to do to maintain or um, evolve with the planet, or are we imagining a sort of like a global confrontation in some way? And I'm just wondering, like. I, it seems like this is where where the words and all the the work. It's sort of like how do we, how does one create a sort of critical mass and acknowledge the di difference, you know? And how like I think that's sort of the that to me is like the big question of like the, what this whole thing is is offering us, you know? Um, I, and and the next question that they you know, the next question that they asked is sort of like, what is the relationship between the community-based challenge and the global issues? Like, so again, we're talking about like, how the individual operates and the bigger, larger question and how those things interface. And I'm just wondering in the work that you do, like, um, how, do you, how do you talk about or present to people on the ground? Like, do you talk about what are you preparing for something, or are you just uh, trying to strengthen what's what's there? Do you know? I don't know. Just one example came to mind. Um, another project that we're working on besides the Sandy Project is a project called Water Warriors, and uh, my collaborator just actually went to North Carolina to, to put um, together a photo show that documented um, this amazing struggle against fracking that was happening in New Brunswick. And, and it was interesting because it's, you know, we're trying to take the story of this incredible, actually like, I mean, really led by indigenous communities, but then became a coalition of like French speaking Acadians and other non-native white people, and sort of then translate that to North Carolina where there's a lot, of, you know, fracking is hotly contested and thinking about translating it to like a rural white community in the US. Um, and I, I brought up a quote actually from one of the um, Mi'kmaq um, First Nation women who's like really powerful and I think a lot of her interview and sort of words really like resonated. And I think a lot of what storytelling is is like how do we connect our personal experiences though we may have a lot of difference and I think it's, it's so important that we celebrate that difference but that there's like a, a connection. So it's okay, I just wanted to share her words but she said, um, I, never, I had never participated in a protest before. The first night I went out to stay was the night of my daughter's prom. I got her ready like any mother would. I made sure her makeup and hair were done and took some pictures. And as I said goodbye to her, I left for camp. At that moment, I decided as a parent, it would be irresponsible not to fight for this cause and to stay with it until it was done. <laughs> I forgot what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Well, I mean, yeah. You can to, to global. Yeah, to the global. And, and, and it's impossible not to do that. You know, you've got the Southwest with no water. You've got Yemen with no water. Mm -hmm. Bangladesh with no water. Mm -hmm. You've got, um, you know, I was down in um, meeting with the Global South. And, uh, and I'm sorry, not the Global South, uh, the Gulf South Rising. And uh, they're losing the um, size of a football field of land every hour. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, if you ever thought about where the intersectionality of racism and climate change is, that's down in the global, in, in, the, in, the, in the Gulf South. Mm -hmm. 
And so, uh, can you say that again? The Gulf, uh, the Gulf South, I'm sorry, I keep saying global because she said global. <laughs> yeah, but the, the <coughs> Gulf in what? They lose the, yeah. uh, the size of the football field of land every hour. Yeah, because of the war. And that's happening here in the United oh. States. But there's also things happening in Yemen and there are things happening in Bangladesh and they're happening all over the world. And so, um, so and, and our people who are here are from those places. And so it creates the opportunity to have these conversations about what's happening over there and what's happening over here. And what are the opportunities that we have over here so that we could, because this country does have a lot of power and is responsible for a lot of it. So what are the things that we can do here to start moving away from fossil fuel? How do you get an entire community off the grid. And so while people may think it's small and it's very local, it could be really transformational and it could set a trend. And so we constantly connect what's happening in different parts of the world um, to what's, because to not do that is not to know your audience. Uh, to look at an audience in a community and not talk about what's happening in the world is to not see their faces and, and to not celebrate their difference. And you know, we say it, it either all matters, it, it's either all good or it's no good, you know? So, um, so you know, that, that kind of flavor that we have in New York City of having the world here is a really cool thing and it provides us with a big opportunity to make those connections. So, um, so yeah, we have to do that. And then, you know, with the Global South, we have, we're part of a movement. You know, they come here because this is where the United Nations is and this is where the big foundations are and we have meetings with them and we host meetings with, with folks from literally all over the world and our community gets to interact with them. And, and they identify on the basis of struggle and struggle here and struggle there is still struggle. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't think that that is really challenging to do. That's, that's the easy bell stuff. But the thing that's so unique about Uprose and a Puente and you know some some other groups that were um, that are that I've met that are very um, active in climate justice fights here in New York is that you're doing that and I think most <coughs> so many groups don't um, but we're doing it all over the country it's not just us I mean we're part of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. We are part of the Climate Justice Alliance. They're out in California, Poder, Yuca, down in the Southwest, in Detroit, in California, and in Chicago. We have organizations that are doing this literally like all over the country. The thing is that we are under-resourced. We do um, big things with very few resources. Right. That's a conversation for another day about what <laughs> happens. Um, but, um, but you bring that political context and that global context in a way that um, is not the norm for a lot of community groups that are struggling and have their you know nose in their community and um, you know we've seen it all the time in working with community groups is not an alternative um, uh, in collaborations where they, you know it's it, our, we're interested in, engage, in engaging in the site specific and the particular as a means of pointing to the universal and um, you know and the systemic right and you incorporate that in your narratives all the time, and I think that that's really powerful. You're you're empowering your community with um, political education um, that that uh, that takes them to a whole other place than if it were just like you know, we're driving a little circle around our experience. Yeah, it's interesting too how it kind of conflates geography too, because like Yemen is in your neighborhood. Do you know what I mean? Like you. you because I think a lot of this problem is you have to like, yeah, you have to bring, you have to bridge what seems to be these enormous gaps, and you you manage to do that very quickly just because you're 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 looking at difference, and and that's one of the things that you honor because like you have you have a connection to Yemen, so Yemen in a way is close. It's not this this great distance. So those I think that intersection. Um, and those making connections, drawing those things out is a way to get people to understand, like, um, have a, a more holistic understanding of the problem, and then maybe um, feel more empowered holistically to kind of deal with it. So what it matters what they do here, it matters, it, it has a diff it makes a difference somewhere very far away. Um, the, the next question is really about, it's about art making and fortifying communities, and I'm really interested in this idea of how maybe story or your interest in kind of symbol or naming it relates, you know, relates to this to this this question of 
the, the, um, the connections being made and the intersections being made and then how does one represent what that what is actually happening and how does the representation of it not actually make it fall apart but actually galvanize it in some way. And I think that that's, um, I'd be interested in terms of like how you think story does that and then also but how the work that you do with um, creating symbols and you, you these these panels are all not an alternative and this organization does really great things in terms of giving people tools that have to do with rep representation and I'm just interested in hearing um, you guys talking about that. Well I could talk a little bit about some of the projects that we have coming up and what we're thinking about. Um, one, we're really excited about partnering with Uprose where um, Uprose used to do toxic tours and rolling workshops and so on in their uh, community before Sandy destroyed two of your buses. Um, and uh, our Natural History Museum has now a 15 passenger mobile museum bus um, that's kind of wrapped with, uh, I don't know, animals and symbols and taxidermy and so on and <laughs> natural history museums. Um, and so we're going to be teaming up so that uh, now they can have a bus again to, to start up that, that program and um, we're really excited to then document those tours and bring them into the context of climate change and climate justice exhibitions. Um, one of the things, we just came back a couple weeks ago from the American Alliance of Museums annual convention. It's the world's largest museum convention. There's 7,000 museum professionals from 60 countries around the world. And we found ourselves with the single largest exhibitor spot in the wow. entire convention center. <laughs> Thanks to um, some allies in the upper echelons of uh, the Alliance who really appreciated our muckraking. And um, and so we took it. It was it was nine times bigger than all the other museums there, and right <laughs> next to the Smithsonian and the American Museum. Of <laughs> so we um, did an exhibition on fossil fuel industry greenwashing in science museums, and specifically recreating installations from the American Museum of Natural History, but inserting previously excluded socio-political context, i.e., the role of their board member and biggest sponsor, David Koch, or Koch Industries. Um, the, like, the best moment of the convention for me was the night before the exhibition opened where we were in a bar and met some exhibition designers from Brooklyn, and it turns out that they do exhibitions for the American Museum of Natural History, and specifically work on their traveling exhibitions. We're like, oh, no way, and then it turned out we had a bunch of friends in common, so we were like very politically aligned and enjoying our drinks together. And, uh, and so my partner pulled out his phone to show him a picture of one of the installations they had just finished installing that day. It was a recreation of a 2009 climate change exhibit uh, installation in the uh, 2009 climate change exhibition that AM and each did. Uh, and it has, it was actually a very cool installation the first time around. Uh, it had a polar bear on top of an iceberg with a lot of, with tra a bunch of trash um, and like a, a uh, and, and a bunch of trash that get in, like traced to New York City. So it was like an interesting commentary. It was almost like an art installation in the American Museum of Natural History. But we thought it would be perfect to add a Coke Industries pipeline, you know, oil pipeline, right <laughs> in this mound of trash under the polar bear. So Jason pulled out his phone to show this exhibit designer a picture of that installation. And he said uh, that, that the guy said, um, yeah, yeah, I built that. Wait a second. No, I didn't. And he pulled out his phone and showed a picture where he had just installed it in Italy, and side by side they were almost identical, except for those pipelines. Um, so that was a really exciting moment. But for us, in being there, we were really interested in sort of um, doing something on a par with the other museums so that we would be taken seriously as a museum um, and to get into the museum sector in order to transform it from within. Um, and I, uh, you know, and um, shoot, I was so excited to tell that story that I, I was going to relate it back to your question. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, I think it does in the sense of like how, how the, I mean, oh, art and signifiers, yeah, and, right? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, you know, these are very uh, like 
legitimizing authoritative aesthetics that natural history museums do. And they have their own like legacy of colonialism all the way back, right? Um, so there's, there's so much that's problematic within these museums, but I find them fascinating. Like they're museums within museums almost. Um, uh, and, um, and so, you know, it, it was interesting being on the convention floor because it was an expo. Most of, most of what was there was like vendors selling their services or the other traveling exhibitions were exhibits that museums could buy, you know, or lease to come to their institutions. Mm. So half the people that came to visit had that mindset when, and they were like, what am I looking at? Um, and at first they were like, why are you criticizing yourself? <laughs> and they were like, oh, this is so edgy. <laughs> um, but a bunch of natural history museums there that are affiliated with universities were like, can you bring this to our uh, oh, museum? Wow. And we're like, yes, we have, we have a menu of options <laughs> in this sliding scale package. We can do all kinds of exhibitions. So we're really interested in this idea of like, producing a couple of like cookie cutter exhibits on like um, the climate denial machine, you know, or on collective responses to climate change. But then, um, you know, and taking them to different places like the Florida Natural History Museum or the Kansas Natural History Museum, but then customizing them to the local context mm -hmm. so that they can serve as vehicles mm -hmm. to amplify local campaigns mm -hmm. so that local activists can leverage that platform and we can do programming and panel discussions, etc. And then when we're shooting video and talking about environmental burdens in Sunset Park and toxics on a waterfront in a storm surge, that that then is in the context of, like that's a video that we're showing in these other places talking about the storm surge in Indiana or in Florida, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, I think that with, at, at an alternative, they have this great, they're, they're like, they give you like this, they talk about everything they do in terms of its thematics, but then also in terms of its tools. So like, they give you these kind of tool building things like this, and, and it's, it's um, and I think I'm, it's interesting because I, it, it, it takes part of what that process is, is dealing with aesthetics, do you know what I mean, in terms of how one gives people, to, people tools to communicate and how aesthetic kind of plays in into that. I also think it's about, like, so amazingly, like, edgy, like, pushing people and joining people around issues of struggle, but it's also about trying to sort of, like, support people's imagination of what's possible. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, uh, What's interesting about the group in Canada is that it's it's like at least a temporary success story. They were able to like knock out the current politician and get someone that was aligned with their politics and then get a moratorium on fracking. So after months of like using their bodies and they built this amazing fire blockade to stop these exploratory trucks that were trying to explore for natural gas and sort of stop this process um, from leading to fracking they were able to have like a success story. And so I think it's like really critical that we kind of like lift up what we are able to do um, so that people can just like imagine, okay, why would I do that? What's possible? Is this possible to actually stop? Because I think it, what's the, ch you know, one of the big challenges with climate change is it just feels so huge. It feels like I can't do anything, particularly when it's put on like, do I compost my trash or do I buy this thing when it's so like minimized into like the personal that I'm supposed to change it. Um, but, but there are victories and we are able to win things and I think that is really critical to like share. Mm -hmm. and, and I think the thing is that the victories have to be short term and long term. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to be accessible. They have to be things that people can wrap their heads around and that sustains engagement. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we had you know, we expanded the Fourth Avenue Median, and the community was involved. And we gave them maps, and we put them on the bus, and we taught them the language of planning, and they decided what that looked like. Uh, the waterfront park that just opened on 43rd Street and First Avenue took 15 years, and so that happens in somebody's lifetime. And when you engage people in these sort of short-term, you know, one-year, three-year campaigns. 
that's half success, people keep coming back and they can then they sustain over time. Because you know, when you've got people that have two or three jobs and families and have to come home, uh, the last thing they want to do is go to a meeting. Right. So they need to be able to see the benefits of their engagement in the short term. And so you have to be able to do that. And integrating art into that is really important because not everybody learns the same way mm -hmm. and not every not everybody engages the same way. And there are a lot of different ways of engaging people by using different kinds of art. You know, whether it's spoken word or whether it's the zoning workshop we had recently with Legos. Or uh, we had our young, our children, we had a, um, we got the park, but it didn't have a playground. And so we've been holding these workshops with children with materials that they collect that they bring from the house. And they use those materials to design the kind of playground they want to have. Mm -hmm. And they do presentations, this is what I want to do. And, 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 and they're doing it using just stuff that they bought from home. And it's really, really cool and beautiful. And, and in the process, they're developing the language of planning and sustainability. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got nine-year-olds talking about green infrastructure. Yes. And, and it's, the coolest, it's the coolest thing. Mm -hmm. And they like it. They like using that language because little kids like big words, yeah. you know, like, like Tyrannosaurus Rex. Well, <laughs> instead of Tyrannosaurus, we say infrastructure. And, and so, um, so there's a lot of ways uh, that art is used to engage people in planning, in land use, in zoning, in all the things that make your eyes glaze over, uh, because they do, especially at the end of a long day. Um, and so um, so that that's extremely important. And I, I think that you know, I, I know I've mentioned the the, the, the the march a few times, but that was the most beautiful example of how art took the local narrative and made it global. And the, but the process, it wasn't what happened that day that was as important as the community building process that people came around, people came together for the, for the art builds. And while they were painting, and while they were building, and while they were cutting, and while they were doing all of that, they were ha we were having conversations about climate change and community. And so there was learning going on and relationships being built while they were getting ready for that without them even thinking about it. And, and that sustains, because now people want to know when is the next one, we want to do another art build. We had this Mother Earth event a few weeks ago, and all we did was, you know, we, we did a lot, we, we did a learning circle around, around climate change in the park, but we flew kites, and we had these kite kits, and people came and built their kites together, and they were all about the kites, because the kites reminded them of the, of the march. And, you know, so people brought their families, and people who might not come to a protest, might not come to a workshop to learn about zoning, will come to build kites. And in the process of building kites, will learn about these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So the art piece is, is really, really powerful. Um, how much time do we have? We have 11 minutes. Left? Until five. <laughs> um, I'm curious about this question, which is the, your, I mean, and maybe we've, we've covered it, but just to go big picture, a little bit about language. when. When you talk, when when you think about sort of main, the mainstream environmental movement, this is the question about um, what are the limitations or what are the are there contradictions that you see with that in terms of what you're doing and what you think the mainstream idea of it is. Well, I, I mean, I, you kind of addressed this question. Do you, do you have more that is there? Well, I was just going to say, I, you know, I, I've worked with and for a bunch of the big green groups, and, um, you know, there's a lot of good that they do, but there's a lot that's been so frustrating, and, uh, and a lot of damage that they do uh, and have perpetrated as well. Um, just today, I read an announcement that the Sierra Club elected their first black president. Um, and part of that came out of Robert Bullard, the sort of uh, grandfather of environmental justice. Uh, movement was um, board chair and, and, and they um, made this an important part of their mission, put out a statement around Black Lives Matters when it happened and its relationship to uh, environmental issues and climate change and why um, white um, uh, middle class environmentalists should care and should get involved 
Um, and this is like coming like so far from where the Sierra Club was, you know, like a decade ago with a, like a disastrous vote on immigration, you know, wanting to lock down our borders. Um, so I, 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 um, I've seen some, some progress um, in the big greens, the mainstream environmental movement. And part of that I think is um, because of the discourse on climate change. Um, and uh, it, it, and it, it didn't just happen. It was because there were a lot of groups uh, on the front lines of the climate crisis and from uh, Climate Justice Alliance and others that, that really have been pushing this. Um, and I know it's a, it, it hasn't been fun or <laughs> long history. Um, but, uh, but you know, I saw a lot of work being done in the context of the People's Climate March that was um, really inspiring. <coughs> There's still a long way to go. but. Um, but that, but that's a huge, that's a huge thing for environmentalists to get out of their silo and recognize the interconnectedness of, um, of these issues. Um, I would just say that I mean I think the the unfortunate thing is that the more extreme weather and pollution and sort of opportunities to have frontline communities based in the U.S. Um, but it, it's growing, right? And so the need is for environmental groups to really. Like take let frontline communities take the lead um, and sort of be the be somewhat of the voice of climate change. I think that was a big you know discussion as part of the messaging for the People's Climate March is what is the, where is the voice of frontline communities and how are they um, lifted up as part of that. I mean I think interestingly it's actually been it's been difficult as part of the Sandy Project. Like I, I never thought it would be hard to try to convince people that this is like this incredible opportunity where all these people have been directly affected to actually, you know, connect them to the larger environmental movement, and that's actually been a struggle. And so it's just a process of trying to sort of negotiate that and, and figure that out. So I, I'm part of the National Environmental Justice Leadership, and um, Aaron uh, was with Sierra Club for 30 years. And we have been beating up Sierra Club for a really long time. <laughs> and, um, and I think that um, we have had, um, as a movement, as part of the leadership, lots of conversations with the big greens across the table, like really big fights with the big <coughs> greens. Um, because when the big greens realized that uh, the demographics were changing and that it was important, to start bringing people of color into the movement, what they did was they hired folks to come into our community and supplant the work that we were doing and to, uh, and to basically start doing the work for us. Uh, but I think that the turning point really wasn't Bob Buller. I think the turning point really was Cap and Trade because that was a huge, huge fail. And that was one where we were really trying to get uh, the big greens to understand. Uh, we were asking them for very simple things. We were asking them, to uh, include co-pollutants, that it couldn't just be carbon, and that um, the legislation had to address the siting of facilities, that uh, pushing cap and trade wasn't going to stop power plants from being sited in communities of color, either in the United States or in different parts of the world. And they didn't give and they didn't realize that things had changed, mm -hmm. that things had changed nationally, that there was a new administration, that we were in a very different position than we had been in the past. And so out of that comes this uh, meeting that we had with a few foundations where we created this thing called Building Equity and Alignment. And we met with Greenpeace and we met with Sierra Club and we met with a bunch of uh, big greens, uh, some, some uh, foundations, to try to figure out how do you support the work on the ground? How do you make sure that there is a different kind of allocation of resources that um, big greens that have a lot of wealth in terms of information and technical assistance mm -hmm. can work in a way that complements what's happening locally right. and doesn't supplant so that we can be more strategic in how we work with each other to address this behemoth that's called climate change. Mm -hmm. So there has been a lot of work that happens before Aaron then steps up. And then, um, and, and, and honestly, uh, I was really excited. You should have seen all my emojis. Um, <laughs> when he got appointed, I was doing the Snoopy dance. And um, I was very proud of him, really happy. Um, and, but they understand, but I, but I think that one of the things that happened, at least in the last two years, is that Sierra Club, um, and, you know, here's the, here's the other thing that, because I don't want you to think that we have an anti-Big Green thing. Every one of these organizations has these people in there that are fighting a good fight, mm -hmm. that are looking out, that are looking out 
for our communities that work with us in a way that's just, that brings resources to our communities. But there is a culture to these communities, these organizations that is very exclusive and is really kind of old school. And so, um, so there's this new energy there and these people that are really pushing. And as they push and as they take positions on immigration and stuff like that, their members start finding out, hey, it's not so scary, it's all good, mm -hmm. it's gonna work, it's fine. Mm -hmm. And so they're being moved from these places of comfort and these sort of like dated positions that they've had into a space that is more relevant, it's gonna be more relevant for them. Their survivability depends on their relationship with us. There is no way that uh, organizations that deal with conservancy, that deal with, you know, with land trust, with issues that have not been relevant to our communities, will be able to thrive in the future unless they have a base that looks like us. So they have to, for their own survival, build those relationships. And then they should just do it because it's the right thing. But if they don't, at least, you know, but that doesn't always work with people, but there is, in order for them to be able to survive in the future, they have to start laying the foundation for moving in a different direction. And we've been developing those relationships with them because listen, we don't, you know, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The truth is that these organizations have a lot of resources and they have expertise in a lot of different areas that are really important for all of our communities, whether you're talking about Indian country or you're talking about Detroit. And so the idea is how do you build those relationships so that we do what is gonna be necessary. There are gonna be fewer resources and there's gonna be more extreme weather events and so we need to be able to be working with each other in a way that's strategic, that brings power and resources to all of our communities. And so we're real open to doing it. And I think that the fact that Sierra Club took this step was, was, was really awesome. And, um, but, but it didn't just happen with Bob, you know, anointing the brother. It really, oh, I love, oh, I love Bob, but it didn't happen. It was really sort of the culmination of 20 years of struggle. Right. So, all right. I'm sorry, I went on too long. <laughs> um, questions? I think we have a, probably a few questions we can take. Right. I know, Melanie <laughs> wants to ask the Anthropocene question. No, I think no. We, should, I, we have time for two. We really, have two? Two okay. really good questions. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Do, we have, Do we have people with really good questions? <laughs> or burning questions? Burning questions. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering what your response is to the, like I can see how amazing it is that there's all this work being done around the world on a local level and so on and so forth. And then at the same time, like as we speak, we're closer and closer to this massive, horrible trade deal going through, um, you know, the Trans-Pacific trade deal. Trade deal. Um, and which would have, you know, potentially horrendous consequences for all the things that we're talking about. And it has to do with like this in increasing foreclosure of the democratic process, which I'm wondering about, you know, in relation to the global and you know the extent to which the US in particular is a very forceful presence and, along with, you know, other major global forces. Um, so, so, so what about like how do you see your work in relation specifically to um, a kind of I'm not sure what the word is like recuperation, reinventing, you know, et cetera, of the democratic process itself, which feels so dangerous. First, it's a big thing. Okay. Um, I. You know, it ties to also what you were making me think about, um, where you say don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, the big greens bring a ton of resources and have a lot of potential to, to play a, an important role in the struggle, right? Um, and that derives from an understanding of institutions as not monolithic, right? They're um, made up of a lot of individuals and, you know, and a bunch of them are fighting a good fight. And for us, that's been the, that's, that's, been our, uh, that's informed our entire practice as not an alternative, and specifically our project, the Natural History Museum, is um, 
is to um, occupy institutions by occupying institutionality as a form. That's our specific tactic here. Mm -hmm. But in general, this idea of occupying institutions in order to create space for champions on the inside to make change. Mm -hmm. And that this needs to happen across all sectors of society. And if you know, we're, we're talking about community as the theme here, right? Um, building power at the local level, at the community level is really important, but making the connection to you know, the systemic and the other examples uh, across the world is really important. So situating the community within a global context is essential. Um, and, and part of that has to do with like really challenging, I think, um, the United States left uh, um, ambivalence to uh, to power, right? Like we've we've really celebrated these DIY expressions because our institutions have failed us. They've been hollowed out by neoliberal budget cuts. So fuck them, right? Has been the orientation of like my generation, certainly the millennials, and so on. So we need a new vocabulary around power and um, and uh, understanding of, of how to how to deal with it and. Um, just more specifically with the Natural History Museum project, like that's a slice, that's a little sliver we're taking on, and you know, part of that is by forming, by by collectivizing scientists, you know, who normally are out back in the lab, right? Um, collecting them as a political body to speak out against the attack on science and to kick the fossil fuel lobby out of science institutions. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it feels like Elizabeth, you've been talking a lot about like the relationship, you know, the, the, the privilege, the issue of privilege and these forging new sorts of relationships of power. So I feel like that speaks a lot to what you're talking about in terms of, she's already, I mean, she's imagining a different kind of, like reimagining that, what it means to have a democratic process. And, and we're doing at every event voter registration. <laughs> and we're telling everyone who is part of the movement that they have to include uh, an aggressive voter registration campaign, that that has to be really visible. That whenever we have an action, that whenever we have a community event, that whatever it is, you have to have an aggressive voter registration campaign going on at the same time. Yeah, that's one of the things we do. Um, I think one of our tactics is around participatory storytelling, and I think one of the biggest barriers to dem democracy is like people not having a platform in which to share. It's one of the interesting things about um, participatory budgeting and why it's so successful is that people have a platform to voice what they think should be happening in their community and actually then have the power to you know, get, get money to actually do that. Um, so for us, it's been an interesting process over the last years as much as we're trying to tell a better story about Sandy because we're trying to empower all of the amazing experts and communities um, like Elizabeth and Sunset Park and there's people in New Jersey and there's people that have been part of the recovery for the last two and a half years that are have so much knowledge and wisdom to share and so we're trying to sort of create a platform where their voices are, are able to be heard. Um, and interestingly, I think we've also seen, you know, which isn't just attributed to us, it's also the power of technology, but, you know, we're trying to be in meetings with, like, you know, different publications like The Guardian and The New York Times, and we're starting to see, like, participatory storytelling in the way that they're reporting, where they're actually asking, you know, their audience to contribute to the reporting and the process of what they're sharing. And so, to me, that's really exciting, and to try to, like, push that envelope, because as much as a as a grassroots media maker, I want to think that we have tons of power. It's, it's really needed to transform our media institutions and the way that these stories are being told. Mm -hmm. Another question? The last question? <laughs> really? <laughs> we just covered it all. Yeah, Sander? I, I, I have a question that, that you know, I, the pressure of it being the last question and also a good question <laughs> is like a burden. But, um, <laughs> but I, I could have, ever since you mentioned adaptation and the way you have, I can't stop thinking about it. I'm fascinated by it. Um, and about this, this, this uh, process of, of returning to a kind of a, a, a cultural memory and, and, um, and kind of reinscribing it in the present tense. And I'm just curious where, uh, if there's been communities 
uh, in particular that you that you found are doing are, are taking part in, in that adaptive process in really creative in really creative ways? I think well, certainly in indigenous communities that's happening, um, and I think that the the Diné do things like that. But in Brazil, they're doing things like that in the rural communities. Um, and um, we had a delegation visit us from Brazil uh, a few years ago. They were so excited about meeting a group from Brooklyn. And, um, and, and, we, and they had so much to teach us about um, some of the traditions that people brought um, to Brazil from, you know, from West Africa. And, um, and how that was part of how they were becoming sustainable and how they were addressing climate change in the rural communities. And so um, these conversations that we've had with these folks from all over and even just remembering like your own personal stories. Like I remember, you know, the things that my grandmother used to do and how she healed us and how she didn't use Western medicine and how she used herbs and how she grew them in cans of butelo and how she didn't throw anything out. Um, just remembering those kinds of things and really sort of respecting um, some of the local knowledge. You have to respect the local knowledge. People just know all kinds of things and when you create the space for them to share that with you, that becomes sort of a defining moment and things that people share and learn from each other. So there are, if you think about, so if you come to our organization, we're gonna ask you what, who your people are. And we always ask you who your people are because we're gonna research who your people are and we're gonna integrate something about your history and your journey into whatever we're doing so that you feel represented and you feel like you're an integral part of the space, right? So we're constantly listening to what people are saying about their experiences and then they share across. Right, so just to give you a little example, and this doesn't have to do with adaptation, it has to do with planning. We were many years ago facilitating a greenway design, and, we, and people were doing it all in their native languages. And the Chinese women wanted Tai Chi, and they were acting it out, and the Mexican women were talking about artesanía, and they were talking to them, in and everybody was communicating in a different language, and everybody had something to add that came from who they were, and it was going to, define what the greenway looked like. It wasn't just gonna be a bike path, it was gonna be something where culture was reflected. Mm -hmm. And so, it, and, and that, that gives them ownership and it's such a cool thing, it's so fun to sort of sit back and watch this stuff happen. Um, so the adaptation stuff is the same thing, that people know how to grow things, they know how to make things, they know how to, they know how to build things. Um, we don't want to do anything. <laughs> you know what I mean? So you have to approach all of this. All of this has to be approached with tremendous humility and, and a big open mind that these answers are coming from all of these places and that redefines us as a society and that it's okay. That that's, that's, that's what we're all going to look like. All of it. And it's all good. In organizing a Sunset Park, I'll stop. Get excited. Uh, so we know, for example, that with the Polish community, we don't ask them to go to protests. They don't do that. They're children of war, they're not gonna do that. But they love doing uh, stewardship, tree stewardship, that they'll come to. So knowing about all the different groups and what the thing that moves them and, and learning that and respecting it and lifting it, that is how we come up with adaptation solutions. So, mm -hmm. so. I think that's really interesting because I know in like, in, there's that, um, in cognitive science there's this phenomenon with like PTSD that if you can change someone's relationship to their past, their, their idea of their future changes. So I, I, I just, in giant tying this thing between adaptation that we might look back and like how we could imagine a, a different future, a better future, I think that there is a relationship between like what you're doing, which is like, we go back, we reclaim these things, and that, that potentially can radically change the way those people think about their own futures. And, and I think that's what you're, it feels to me like that's what you're doing, which is like, it's really fascinating, because I, you know, I'm on this adaptation thing, which is awesome. That's something we were also really excited about with the potential of like, um, we, we talk about with the museum project that it's um, a part biomimicry, right? We're like really barn these aesthetics and so on. Um, and then uh, and to tell a sort of people's history of natural history. And then part um, uh, like sort of parasitic attachment in a host institution. <laughs> 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 we went to uh, the American Museum of Natural History where they have like 
like the Poiquetil tribe represented mm -hmm. in Franz Boas's like cultural expedition, where the and they're depicted like historically with like cobwebs and you know on the display cases and so on. There's all these static displays of nature. Mm -hmm. Thinking about you know bringing in communities that are actively fighting campaigns in these places that are represented within the museum and having them come in and like, you know, and and, uh, and, and bring the contemporary into the picture. So the Quaketeel tribe is in Vancouver Island are actually actively fighting industrial logging and oil pipelines um, and tar sands. So yeah, like that, that is a sort of interesting juxtaposition of the past and like, I mean, to me the past is created in the present. Very much of a relationship. Yes, Melanie. Well, I just have a burning question. <laughs> um, I know it's the third one, but uh, I'm, I'm doing it. Um, what do you feel like you absolutely know about climate change, and what do you like? What do you absolutely know, and what confuses you? <laughs> <laughs> Is that too much? That's good. I, I should have asked that on the list. When I first moved to New York City, I had this, uh, um, I had this idea that I really wanted to organize a post-apocalyptic movie marathon. Like, I love, you know, Mad Max and this, like, boy and his dog and, like, there are all these movies. <laughs> Um, I don't know, there became a point in the last decade where I realized like that we're already there. We're already in this post-apocalyptic moment. And um, you know, and, and it's a very existential thing to contemplate climate change. Because mm -hmm. we're 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 looking at death, like we're staring it in the face. Mm -hmm. And um, not at the individual scale, but at the you know, at the global scale. And that's that's hard and scary and it's enough to paralyze, right? Um, and so that's a sort of ongoing thing is where do you find your fuel and and for me it's like <laughs> I find it in like Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome you know with this like <laughs> awesome Tina Turner anthem right. you know where it's like even if you're down to like the last like few people are you are you are you fighting like are you fighting on the force of good or evil? Like, it comes down to it. You know? So it's like, pick a side. And that's, that's what we gotta do. You can't, you know, Howard Zinn said, you can't be neutral on a moving train. You know, this is what, like, we just wrote an essay for The Guardian that they put a week ago on the front page of their environment section. Um, that was shared 11,000 times in the last week. Like, Ooh. that was so exciting to me. We're not in a big organization. We don't have a list. Like, but I think you know it resonated. We were, we were we were provoking the museum sector to let go of this false notion of neutrality, as if such a thing were possible, and as if it doesn't mean resignation mm. in the face of death. Right. Right. You know, stand up, take a stand. <laughs> I mean, I think the only thing that I know is that there's like incredible stories of resistance, of trauma, of loss, of connection that I feel like need to be told. Um, and that's kind of my entry point. I, I, I just came back from Paris. I had never been. Um, I was invited to, uh, to speak before a group of thought leaders, and I was the only one talking about climate change. And I couldn't believe it. Um, I, I get up and I go to sleep thinking about it. I feel a little bit like Tina Turner, just a little bit more horizontally gifted and close to me. But um, I, I think that um, I, you know, you don't grow up coming from African and indigenous traditions without knowing that something is happening to Mother Earth. You know that, you grow up in that, you grow up in traditions that say respect the earth and give back to the earth. You know, just a few days ago was the day of Orisha Oko, my belief system. And, uh, and so that's ingrained in us from the time that, that we are very small. And so that clearly it is unwell, and so we are unwell. Um, and I think the thing that freaks me out, the second part of your question, of, of the deniers, the fact that we can't even have a conversation, that, uh, that if we even have a conversation with them, it means slowing down. It means uh, 
not being able to take our energy and our time and our resources to do something to keep moving and that we have to keep moving and so we don't even engage them we're not even having a conversation with them because that would mean slowing down for us means death and so we can't do it and so uh so we choose not to do that uh literally like we will not even engage them if they're on twitter they get blocked i mean that's that's how serious it is uh, because there's no time to let people who are in the way of your child's future to be, they don't deserve time. You know, I'm a mother and, um, and I work with young people and these people are in the way of the, of the future of our children and we just can't. They, they don't get that respect. They don't get our time. So I think that that's the hardest part. Mm -hmm. That, because usually, because we're organizers, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we do, we engage. We can't go back and get We engage, but there are just some people just said, okay, this, this is it, that we can't do this. We need to focus on this. We have a vision, and this is, and we have to just keep it moving. All right. It's okay. close to end. announcements before we let you go. Um, the next dialogue is going to be on uh, Saturday, May the 30th. And actually, Becca will be back to moderate that. Um, yeah, and that is going to be reimagining our countries. Um, and we'll have Vijay Prashad and Helena Helm Hernandez for that. And then um, the final dialogue will be on, on Monday, June 1st. Um, and both of these are right here, and that's going to be uh, our final one. Did I say that already? Restoring our planet. And that'll be uh, Michael Leon Guerrero, uh, Pablo Salone Romero, and it will be moderated by Lisa Damore. Um, if you can't be there in person, we are live streaming all of these events, so you can watch them on HowlRound TV. You can also catch up last week's video and watch this again if you so wish. Um, so do that and spread the word if you have people who are out of town who would be interested in this. This is just one part of a really big conversation. Thank you so much to all of you for your incredible <laughs>